Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Talk number three. Today, we have a packed agenda. We have Bubble Tea with us, who's going to present us their update on the grant initiative on the Python library. We're going to have Zero One Note with us, with Claudio, and uh, have a mini segment of a Q&A with GRTIQ leading that moderation. And we are going to talk about the governance process a little bit and how to engage in the forum, as well as Josh, who will give us an update on you know, the latest innovations coming out of Streaming Fest. But we're going to start off with community updates all around the network and ecosystem. And uh, the first one that we have today is the newest addition to the graph team, George Adams. Welcome. Hey guys, I'm so excited to be here. Awesome to have you. George, you've started with the foundation last week. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, so prior to the graph, I worked at a FinTech company uh, called M1 Finance. Uh, I was actually the first hire on the business team there. Um, so my title there was just everything strategy and finance. I did um, all the company accounting in the beginning, um, you know, helped with fundraising, uh, help with all like financial modeling anytime we had a new initiative. Um, and yeah, so I, you know, I, I'd been into crypto since like late 2016, early 2017. Uh, you know, once you go down the rabbit hole, it's, it's hard to think about anything else. Uh, but I had such a good job and I, you know, was tied down with equity that for me to leave, I would have had to have an insane opportunity. And, you know, that's pretty much what happened with the graph. What excited you to come to the graph? Yeah, so I mean, there's like two big things. One is it's one of the few, you know, very workable products in crypto that, um, so I think that's first and foremost important. Like, you know, actual dApps are relying on the graph to uh, service their applications. Uh, and the, se the second big thing for me is, um, you know, there's this like trade off in crypto between decentralization and scalability. Uh, you know, they, and, and usually they say you need to sacrifice uh, scalability for decentralization, but there's a few protocols that seem to be more scalable because they're decentralized. And I think the graph fits in that bucket. Um, you know, anyone in the world could be an indexer. Uh, you know, if, if there's demand for data, I think that there's a financial incentive for anyone in the world to index that data and make it available. Yeah, great insight. I, I, I see a GRTIQ interview upcoming there. Great insight you're sharing. Um, tell us about what you are going to be focusing on uh, in the, at the Graph Foundation going forward. Yeah, so uh, I think like one of the big missions for the Graph as a whole is just like making data more accessible and more available to people. Uh, I think that's important at a global level, but also at a, at a local organization level. So I want my goal to be at the Graph to make our financial data, anything the, the foundation's financials, as accessible and digestible to all the stakeholders uh, involved, including the community, uh, including any decision makers, uh, so that we can lead to better decision making. Awesome. Well, thank you very much and welcome to the graph, George. We're gonna be excited to work together with you. And everyone, just to give you all a quick reminder, as always, we have Slido open. If you have any questions at any point in time that you wanna ask, you can post them in Slido, including any questions for George, and we can get back to that later on. So welcome again, George. Thank you, thank you. Okay, let's move on with an update on governance. Many of you know about a feature that has been in development, which is deploy and signal. I wanna just take the opportunity to provide a quick update on that. It is in fact in the final stages of being deployed. It has been reviewed and approved by the council in snapshot vote. And, and now we are in the process of executing it. We don't have a specific timeline other than saying it's going to be soon. It's really at the last stage at this point. So I'm pretty excited to uh, hopefully announce soon that this is going to be implemented. As the next one on the list, we have Masari. And many of you have may, may have seen a lot of Twitter posts about Masari mainnet. And Martin is going to tell us a little bit more about what that's all about. 
Yeah, thanks, Oliver. Um, so Mesari Mainnet is a crypto event organized by a, a company called Mesari. Um, it's happening here in, in New York uh, for three days. Um, and the graph is sponsoring and uh, several people from the graph community are around um, and have a booth. So if you're around the event, please show up at the booth. And there's swag to get. I've, I've heard there's socks of the graph or something. And there's also talks given by Eva. Uh, Tegan from Engine Node, and there's also Joseph from Figment, and so a couple of people from the community going around, and and yep, that's that's it. And we have a party tonight, right? I believe there's yeah uh, a side event tonight too. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. So we're gonna hear more coming out of that. It's very busy. They have a packed agenda, talking about a lot of things, and the graph with everyone that Martin has mentioned, definitely heavily engaged in it. Awesome to see. Let's talk a little bit about the latest TRTIQ podcast that we've had. It's been unique in the sense that it's been by somebody who's been with the graph in the early stages, but is not necessarily on the tech side of the business. So me as a non-technical person, I found it extremely exciting. And GRTIQ, why don't you tell us a little bit about the experience talking to Carl Hargaving? Well, thank you, Oliver, and hello, everybody. I'm really grateful to be here, and I appreciate everybody that listens to the GRTIQ podcast. So thank you for all your support. Uh, in planning for today's call, we dis discussed talking a little bit about episode 28, which featured Carl Hagerling. And uh, for those of you that didn't listen to that episode, it's a really great entry into the graph and it's non-technical. Uh, Carl is a graphic, I'm sorry, he's an industrial designer uh, by career. He's worked at some incredible companies, right? So uh, went out to San Francisco. He's from Sweden, moved to San Francisco because his uh, wife had a, a job out there. And uh, while he was there, really got involved in the tech scene and uh, worked at Facebook, had an opportunity to go to Tesla, uh, a lot of really cool companies and opportunities. So he's got this really great pedigree, professional pedigree. And he talks about meeting uh, the founders early on of the graph and then going on to co-found and become design lead at Edge and Node. So that's episode 28 with Carl Hagerling. And uh, really uh, my favorite part of that episode, I don't know about you, Oliver, was when Carl talked about the method and the process by which he came up with the graphs logo and branding elements. And uh, it was a lot of fun to hear how he approached that and what the different things mean. And so uh, for those of you that are interested in those types of things and would like a non-technical background on the graph, this is another great episode. And then just by way of information, episode 29 came out just shortly after uh, that one. And that was an interview with Curation Station, uh, which is a uh, stakeholder group here building a community around curation. Derek uh, with Data Nexus has been featured here in Community Talk before, and he was joined by Graph God. And so that was a pretty good exploration of curation there. I'd love to give a teaser for this Friday, uh, if I can, Oliver, and just say that uh, this Friday's podcast will feature an interview with a prominent user and longtime partner of the Graph and how they utilize the graph to power their solution in the market. So that's the update here. Amazing, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a good highlight you brought up there from the call interview. The design actually has a deeper meaning than just a few dots, essentially. It's, uh, it's, it's quite amazing to hear it because once you hear it, you can actually see it and interpret the branding much better. So that was great insight. Okay, let's switch gears to our Wave RFP and grant ideas. We have a forum post actually by Reem. Reem, why don't you tell us what's that all about? Yeah, hey everyone. Um, nice to see you or hear from you today. Um, so I think what makes the Graph Foundation very unique from a lot of you know traditional Web two spaces, or even um, maybe you know we're seeing this a lot and, and emerge within the Web three space. Um, is that we don't want to build the graph on our own and we want to provide the opportunity for all of you to get involved. Um, we've gotten a lot of ideas from, from a grant perspective and uh, to give you an idea of how that works is uh, once a team or an, an individual uh, has an idea that they want to post to the foundation that maybe we haven't thought of before, uh, they submit a grant application. 
Now, what RFPs are, and for those that aren't familiar with what that um, stands for, is request for proposal. Think of it like a little job posting that we put up there that actually comes with the details um, and requirements and the outcome of what your uh, responsibility is for that um, posting. Um, we're actually looking for ideas from the community that maybe we haven't thought of um, to put up as uh, proposals. And this could literally be maybe shots in the dark. Now, I'm not the most technical person ever, but um, I've come up with ideas before that I cannot build on my own, but would love to see the community build. Uh, that's something that would constitute as an RFP. Um, so if you can visit uh, the graph forum under uh, the grants section, you will see the list of, uh, or sorry, the forum post I um, put forth in regards to uh, sharing your ideas. Uh, would love to hear from you. And I think Oliver yesterday shared uh, an idea of his um, and and just to get the ball rolling and just to give everybody an idea as to what it, the possibilities are um, with what you could share in RFPs. Uh, so yeah, if you have any ideas, I mean, feel free to post in the forum. If you're a little too shy, hopefully uh, you can find me on Discord uh, and you can also ping me um, directly and then we can have a further discussion about it. But um, we have a very creative community and, and would love to hear from all of you. Awesome. So this is another example of progressive decentralization, right? in that we want to open up more to the community as it relates to RFP and grant ideas that we want to rally around. And that's really what the spirit of this post is, as Reem has just described. You, you do see me having posted an idea this morning, um, which I had come up with you know, on the heels of all the discussions we've had around decentralization lately, and that is an idea for a graph decentralization dashboard. Look at my post here, not as a foundation member, but rather as a community member, right? So what I post here is the same thing that everyone else is invited to post as well. You can comment on my idea, you can post your own ideas. And that's really what it's all about. We want to get more community involvement you know, around these things that typically have been more closely managed you know, by the foundation in the past. Awesome, thank you, Reed. Okay. That concludes our community updates and we get into our feature segments now. We will start with Bubble Tea. And Bubble Tea is a grantee who has, who is in the process of building a Python library to enable developers and data scientists to quickly build any data applications on top of the graph network. We have Quan here with us today. Welcome, Quan. Hi everyone, this is Kwan. Uh, I'm here with my co-founder CJ. We're based in New York City. Um, a small correction, we, the Bubble Tea is a developer library. It's not, it's not designed for iPhone. It's like a Python based library. Typically right now, I think it's very much focused on web. Um, now the project has, although it's called a Bubble Tea, it has nothing to do with the popular drink in Asia, um, but it has everything to do with the graph. So today we're gonna um, like sort of three things. First, I wanna give a quick high level overview of what this library does. I know not everyone on the call is, uh, is a developer. So we will try to stay on high level without getting to technical details. Second, we're gonna show you some demos that you can build with the library. Third, I wanna share with you sort of this process that we, we explore and how we would like to pull, uh, suggest some improvement in the subgraph system. So, um, let me share my screen. And as you pull up your screen, just a quick reminder for everyone, especially as Quan is now showing us what uh, he's done there, feel free to ask questions in Slido that we can ask in real time. Cool, great, thank you. So, um, so if you are, so this is a library we build for developers who are building, uh, try to visualize data on the graph or you are data scientists who want to um, understand using machine learning models to analyze data through the graph network, this develop, uh, this develop library is for you. Um, so in this library, we're solving sort of three major problems. These are two functions which helps you to load data from the subgraph network. The reason why we propose these new functions is that Currently on the subgraph network, there's a limit of uh, a thousand items per API request. Now, when you try to visualize data, let's say you want to put data in the past seven days, past 30 days, very likely you need to make a multiple calls to the API. So we try to solve that problem in the background. You do not need to worry about the pagination. 
we sort of figure out how to pass the uh, limit on the, in the library. So all you need to do is call one function, grab the data based on time. And then the second is called a beta load subgraphs. You notice this S here, that basically helps you to load multiple subgraphs in parallel. Because we notice when you, let's say you want to build a data dashboard to compare the data on sushi swap versus unit swap. That basically means you need to load multiple subgraphs. Uh, and this, this function basically helps you to improve that experience. The second part of the library is aggregation. Now, when you load the data from subgraph, if you want to build a daily chart, weekly chart, hourly chart, we have this function help you to aggregate data. It also provides a more generic aggregation function called group by, which is a very common thing you use in a SQL query like a database, will helps you to group data by a specific column. Um, I, mean, I think these features were gradually offered in the node down the road, but at this moment they don't exist. So we want these tools to make your life better. The third piece is the visualization function. Right now we have line chart, bar chart, area chart, combo chart, and and we're adding more as we speak. Um, and this is built on top of this graphic library called Altair. Now the last piece is called um, a, there's this templating system which helps you to build a dashboard with a small number of lines of code. This is basically, we leverage this open source library called Streamlit. So, and you can install it from, you know, pip. So that's sort of overview of what this library does. It's simple, and that's sort of our first step. Um, next thing, I wanna show you the demos. What you can build with the demos. So this is a very simple demo. We try to visualize the deposit amount of, of Aave um, protocol in the past, like from January 1st to January 10th. And the code you can see is pretty simple. First, you provide the API of the, the URL of the API. Secondly, you enter your query. And then you just load the subgraph. We take care of all the pagination, bypass the API limit. And then you do a little bit um, like data frame transformation, which is documenting your documents. And then you call this function to visualize it. It's, it's just this simple. Now, let me show you something oh. more comp Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, tell us a little bit about maybe if you envision an end product, right? End product even being something as simple as a, as a dashboard of sorts. Mm -hmm. What is it that that Bubble Tea, if you maybe can give some practical examples, what, what mm -hmm. is it that Bubble Tea can enable uh, developers to do that we can all benefit from in the community? Sure. So we basically, that leads me to a second uh, demo. So this is a much more diverse dashboard where you can actually build all sorts of visualization with different types of um, uh, like components we provide. And uh, if you're a developer, let's say you want to visualize data on the graph, there are currently just lots of limitations um, and we try to speed up process for you. Um, you can also build this entire dashboard, like everything you see here, all these components are through this uh, Bubble Tea library, which is built on top of Streamlit. And you just use a few line of code to, um, to show these uh, components. So the entire idea is to simplify the process of building data visualization. Does so you help? Can, yeah, you, so you can, in fact, it, it facilitates not only ex the extraction of data in a more streamlined way, which is what the core capability is of the graph, but also facilitates an easier way to visualize the data in charts. Is that? That's right. That's right. We basically like, this is another dashboard. We use LivePP as an example. Did you notice the state picker where you can choose data? That's just one or two lines of code. You can put in your, put in your file and then this will show up. And then you can build a table chart for these data. So the opportunity that it enables is almost a deeper vertical integration into dApps that utilize the graph. Um, right, yes, we, we, yes, it's sort of a layer, data visualization layer between your application and, uh, and the graph network. Have you had any specific dApps already been uh, inquiring for that? And for um, so that's uh, a very good question that leads to my third thing on my agenda. <laughs> we don't have specific application yet, 
because we currently are trying to build some very useful demo and, and we write a bunch of you know sort of the things we would like the team to improve and if you pay attention to the forum we actually uh, i have been posting lots of feature requests in terms of how do we um you know load data faster how do we provide more query support um, one of the interesting i think is sort of the biggest thing we notice is the subgraphs we definitely need more improvement on the subgraph how to query it how to load the data and more specifically we notice most of the subgraph today on the, the graph network is, is it's a very protocol specific now our vision for the graph network is that we see an opportunity to build a different type of data analytics company on top of this decentralized query layer. Now, if you look at a data company today, like Chain Analysis, Dune, Nansen, they all build on centralized uh, database. Now, in order to compete with this company and even do better than them, uh, we need actually much more capability in the subgraph, which allows us to not only efficiently index data, but also, um, allows us to re-index existing subgraph, pulling data from off-chain data source, on-chain data source, mix them together. Um, so that's how we think a big component to build a data, new data analytics product on top of this decentralized layer. So yeah, if you have question, feedback, please you know, go comment on these posts. They're mostly in question feedback section. Um, I think that will be my demo today. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I think that, you know, one of the key takeaways here for us all is just, you know, an, incre an increased use case, you know, of the graph, right? Yeah. And, you know, anybody here listening that is also engaged maybe in other protocols that have considered the graph in the past might be something worth sharing with other protocols, knowing that these are things that we're working on that enable of our deaths of depths to take advantage of more features right that might be coming for us down the line and we have active forum discussions here um, that are a little bit more technical in nature i know you've been talking to adam there kwan mm -hmm. uh, that's right feel free to pass that on to your technical peers to engage in these discussions because they are really um, very insightful and you know really around an, an innovative way to expand you know the graphs purpose thank you yeah we, we find it extremely helpful to interact with the team because we know there's a bunch of things that we just can't do ourselves we definitely need help from the team to push the boundary uh push the envelope of the sub of the graph network awesome thank you any yeah, questions for kwan anybody would have raised any other questions Okay, very good. Quan is going to be with us here still for the next half hour. So if you have any more questions, feel free to ask them in Slido. Okay, let's move on um, to another innovative uh, yeah, announcement. Ju just wanted to, add, sorry, yes. Oliver, I just wanted to add that this sort of project that Quan built uh, is indeed very interesting. We've seen multiple subgraph developers requesting these sort of features in, in the past for to do better data aggregation and to build new, to basically do analytics on top of all of this data that we are uh, indexing and ser ser serving. It is true that at the moment, um, there are some functionalities or specific features that we do not support. Uh, so these projects really allow the community to um, essentially just use a short-term solution, let's say, but at the same time, uh, it's super helpful to letting us know exactly uh, the sort of features they will need in order to build more sort of data science driven uh, type of use cases. So um, it's pretty cool to see what Quan did. Hopefully other subgraph developers would leverage from this. Definitely uh, a nice thing to have on the client side. Uh, it overcomes some of the short term um, uh, lim limitations that we currently have. So yeah, very excited to see what others will build on top of this. Awesome. Thank you. Just a small correction. Um, most of the technical work is done by my co-founder CJ and uh, the other person, Lee, who is not on the call today. I'm more like a support role. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, be, I, I know CJ and Lee. We've talked before <laughs> and very nice team. Very good. 
Okay, let's move on to another innovative announcement we've seen in the community about a couple of weeks ago, and it came out from Streaming Fast. 300x is the key message here. And uh, as I said in the forum post, it's not the sequel to the movie 300, but incredibly exciting as well. And what it means is we have been given by Streaming Fast more speed to the network using two foundational innovations called Firehose and Sparkle and Josh from Streaming Fast explains us what this is all about in more detail. Josh, take it away. Thanks, Oliver. Uh, so what I'll do first is I'll kind of take a step back and kind of give a, um, a simplified version of what is Firehose, what is Sparkle, as Oliver just mentioned. Uh, the first thing to know is Firehose. So Firehose is a different way to ingest data from the blockchain into the, the database that the graph node would read from. Um, so right now, if you're using different clients on Ethereum or on other networks, it may unpack the data from the, the blockchain in a different way. Sometimes it might not unpack all the data, which is a problem because as the graph, we wanna be able to supply all of the data that a developer might want. So we basically instrumented Firehose as a way to unpack all the data from a transaction. So someone passes a transaction, you know, what tokens were sent from A to B or what action was taken, a, a voting action, whatever it may be how much gas was consumed, what was the price paid, what are the deltas, so what is the change, not just, you know, what was uh, paid out, but what was the first balance, what was the ending balance, because sometimes that makes it easier to do the data aggregation later on. So we want to make it everything unpacked as much as possible, so that later on we can do much quicker calculations on that, or load it into a database in a much faster way. So that's, that's what we call the fire hose, it's a different way to unpack the data and ingest it into the database. And we have actually have some PRs uh, to um, the graph node right now to make that a uh, second um, core way to ingest data into graph node. We're waiting on a bunch of QA and some testing and make sure there's no issues there before it gets deployed at a larger scale. So that's in its own right, even without anything else going on, we believe that would be somewhere to let's say a five to 10 X increase in speed. So with no other um, changes, no sparkle, which, which the next thing I'll discuss, we should already see a good increase in speed. Um, and now, so Sparkle is the way that we do uh, parallelization. So instead of looking at the, the order of history all in sequence, let's do chunks at a time so we can turn on a lot of computers essentially and then run through each chunk all together. So it really speeds up. And that's where we see like that big 300X increase in speed because we can go through all that data very, very quickly. So the 300 specifically is we've been working with the sushi swap uh, team because they want to make sure that you know uh, an indexer can provide that data in you know in a readily uh, in a timely fashion. Right now, indexers are saying it takes them three to four weeks maybe to index sushi swap, which is very long. So now, if sushi the team wants to make a change, well maybe it's another month behind until they can offer that new data. So we were actually able to do it in about two hours, and after about 30 to 35 minutes we're already able to inspect the data because we've already you know, downloaded all the data that we needed. We can inspect it and make sure there's no bugs. And if there are, we would you know, just lose half an hour. So we can iterate very quickly. Whereas as it is currently, it would take that full month of indexing and then you can inspect the data. So it's a, it's a lot slower to innovate and iterate for, uh, for dApps that want to use the graph. Um, the big thing to know, because we, we always like to temper expectations, that parallelization and Sparkle is not something that's part of the graph core yet. It's something that we've built externally. We're working to integrate it, but there are a lot of things we have to figure out with Edge and Node, with Figment. How are we going to integrate this so that it makes sense and is deterministic and in a way that every indexer can run this? So I just want to make sure that that expectation is set that it's not something that's coming out tomorrow or next month. It, there is a lot of work that still needs to be done to be able to bring that kind of advancement to the decentralized network. Uh, however, I mean, the Sushi team is very happy to see uh, that there is a lot of hope right now. Even if Sparkle doesn't come out anytime soon, Firehose seems like it's a lot closer in the time horizon. So they will see some big advancements. So let's say we were to be able to give them 5 to 10x increase in speed. Maybe that three to four weeks is maybe now down to, you know, two, three, four, five days. So they can at least, you know, keep up a lot faster. Um, so that's a big thing. All of this is open source. So any teams that want to work on this, please feel free to reach out. You can join on the, the Discord um, uh, server. We have a channel for Index or Firehose. Feel free to try out to come ask us questions. We're always happy to work with people. 
And uh, yeah, the big thing is that we just want to continue to innovate so we can make sure more dApps are serviced by the graph, especially on these really, really fast chains that just create so much data. How do we serve them? Awesome. Thank you, Josh, for that explanation. Any questions for Josh? Um, I have a question. So, um, this is Quan from Bubble Tea. Uh, so, we've been interested in indexing data from Solano. So, does does this new technology will enable people to actually down the road to index Solano data quickly? Because I know Solano is extremely fast to chain. Thank you. So, so that's, that's a very good question. Solana is something we've worked on in the past. About a year ago, we were doing some work on Solana for like Serum Dex and indexing that. We had built a service that was able to provide historical transactions for Serum. And like right now, if you were to go do a trade on Serum, you know, after you know a few hours, good luck finding that trade history. It's it's Solana is a, a very fast chain, and they have don't have any reliable history solutions. As it stands currently, it does not service Solana completely. We know we can tackle parts of it, and we it's part of our roadmap in the very near future. We're hoping by maybe October, November, we'll be back on working on Solana because we, we would really like to bring Solana to the graph as soon as possible. So I don't want to make any commitments or any other promises on when it will happen, but it is something that's really on our mindset. Uh, we've actually been spending the team at Streaming Fast. We like to do hackathon projects internally, so we you know deep dive into certain different protocols or different ideas. And uh, this past week, we've just kind of been working on Solana specifically, so we get ourselves better acquainted with what is the developer's dilemma right now in Solana, and how do we better solve it for them. So it's definitely something that's really top of mind for us. Thank you. Great question. Any other questions? Yeah, I dropped one in the chat, but I'll I'll, I'll say it out loud. Derek Silva here. Um, Josh, I'm just wondering if you think this approach can be replicated against other um, other complex subgraphs. You know, Uniswaps is obviously huge. Um, you know, a lot of NFT uh, subgraphs are probably generating a ton of data right now. And <laughs> based on a thread I saw earlier today, um, a lot of those um, NFT projects actually break the ERC721 standard. So anything that can be uh, deployed to help um, you know, speed up finding data when it takes three contract calls to to pull up certain types of data, I think would be really helpful to developers. Yeah, so I mean, you bring up a good point there at the end is that sometimes the way that the smart contract is built by the DAP itself has a lot of calls that we can't actually change because that's how it's already built. So unfortunately, we can't help in that regard. And in some ways, Firehose might actually be a little slower than what they built because they've built a kind of workaround, so to speak, rather than building it for data uh, aggregation after the fact. So we've been talking with some teams that they're unhappy with the current way that things work, be it with their own data providers. Um, so they want to try to port uh, their contracts to work within this framework. So that they're, we've been in close contact with quite a few DEXs, especially because DEXs have tons of data going back and forth. Um, the main thing to know is that our Sparkle integration right now, it's written in Go. So we've actually gone through and we're rewriting. When we did the pancake swap, or right now we're working with Sushi Swap, we're rewriting their subgraph in a different language in Go so that it can work with our framework. We would like to not have it be in Go eventually. Um, so that's part of the roadmap as well to make it integrate well with uh, the graph node and how it would work. Um, so it's kind of on a case by case basis. We're talking to some subgraph developers as well. And if anyone else wants to reach out to us who might want to take on helping to write subgraph, um, tr transliterate the subgraph into another language for now, until we get to the point where indexers can run everything. Our goal is not to be a, a, another hosted network for the graph. Our goal is to empower all the indexers to do all this. So while we'd like to go and help everyone one by one, we know that won't scale. We want to make sure all the indexers can can do the scaling for us because that means all the delegators get the rewards, the curators get rewards. We want to drive as much as we can into the centralized network. Cool, good to hear. Uh, Alexi Colpin asked a question as well. I'll read it out for him. In terms of data storage, how much how much does it differ in comparison with current index data by indexer? for example, for Susu Schwab, how much of a data storage difference is there? I don't know the numbers offhand, but if you go into the Discord channel, um, 
uh, index or fire hose. That's where a lot of that's being talked about. Uh, Kuhn from uh, Mind Heart Soul is, has given a lot of numbers in there. You know how big is this BSC node after you know running fire hose for that? So you get an idea from there. And then in terms of the specifics for let's say su sushi swap, I don't know offhand, but I can get that data if you ping me uh, on Discord. I can definitely get you that. Cool. Uh, I'll leave it to Alexi to uh, assuming he's in the Discord. I'll leave it to uh, to leave it to him to to ping you on that. Awesome. Any other questions for Josh? Very good. Thank you, Josh, for that explanation. And again, any other questions coming up at a later point in time, just post them in Slido and we'll get back to it. Okay, for our last segment today, before we switch to Q&As, we are going to talk a little bit about the graph governance process and i will lead the moderation of that segment feel free to ask questions at any time throughout the segment i want to start really at at the beginning of governance how can we all engage in the governance process in a way that allows us to help shaping changes to the protocol that lead to improvements and the place where that happens is called the forum. It's this address up here, forum.thegraph.com. That's where we post all the specific proposals to enhancements of our protocol. We have a ton of discussions where we socialize on ideas, both in Discord and, and in Telegram chats. But as it relates to making specific proposals, this is the place where that occurs and where then the community engages around in deeper discussions. And I just want to walk through a little bit to show everyone how you can get engaged in that process as well. We've just seen the Web3 RFP and grand ideas. So that was posted by Reem. This is not an actual governance discussion where, it, where we talk about protocol changes, but this is about grants and initiatives. So you can see up here, every post has sort of a tag label and as it relates to governance related topics they fall typically under the governance and gips tag so this is how you can essentially start looking for different sort of categories and start filtering for them to see where are the discussions that are relevant that you might want to keep track of and see what's happening let's talk about one interesting proposal that we have that is actually pretty deep in sort of what we're discussing here, but it all boils down to uh, a concept where we're looking for evaluating changes to our current cap that an indexer has, which is 16x, a static 16x number. And on the heels of decentralization discussions, we were talking about, okay, how can we change that to a more dynamic number that changes based on indexer size and that makes it for larger indexers comparatively smaller and for smaller indexers comparatively larger idea being that that would then lead to a more decentralized stake distribution in our network as smaller indexers have comparatively speaking more cap relative to their stake their self stake so the first part, as, as you look at that, I'm not going to go into the deep discussions that we have on this board, is to really just start ingesting and understanding what is a post really all about. And sometimes it might get you know, very technical where it's not necessarily evident from just the original post, depending on how well and how deep you've been engaged in these types of discussions before. A lot of these things, actually become, and that's you know, speaking from my own experience, become a little bit clearer to understand what the scope is and what also the opinions are on these subjects as people are starting to post their opinions on it. And you can get an understanding of ah, the nuances of, of, of different things that are happening. And it actually starts becoming interesting. And this is how you can start developing your own thoughts to it. And at any point in time, you can start engaging in the discussions by posting your own thoughts. And 
the way that it then proceeds from here is a sort of rough consensus where we look at do we end up at a proposal where we do feel many folks in the community have expressed support. So one example would be this one right here, where we talk about the index of cut simplification proposal. So this is a proposal where we're looking to improve for both the indexers and delegators, the way we interpret and, and manage reward cut settings. Right now, you know that we have the reward cut setting and then the effective cut that is more relevant with regards to understanding what the projected APY is. And it's confusing right now. I think everybody agrees on that. And a proposal is put out here that simplifies that process for both indexers and delegators alike. There's a lot of benefits associated with it. So you can see, you know, the first thing you can look at the original post, which is based on Ariel's proposal, gets a lot of likes here that is already a pretty high number. And you can see, you know, in subsequent responses, there is a ton of support for it. And that's how we arrive at that rough consensus where we can say, okay, you know, we can't always quantify exactly how much support we need for a given proposal, but we kind of know when we have it, when we see it. And this is, you know, perfect um, post where I think we have it. From here, we then go into community snapshot voting. So we put it out for actual voting and then it follows the process where everyone can give the yes or no to a specific proposal. And that is something that then becomes a strong input for the council to understand where the community is with regards to thinking about this proposal and then subsequently make a decision that then flows into executing the changes in the protocol. We've been following this process for, for about nine months right now, and we have uh, come together lately with a group just to get a sort of like reflection on it, put our head up and say, how well is this process working right now? And we have identified that a number of things you know, are not working so well right now that we can think about how, how to improve them. One is the simple transparency. The post that I've just shown you has had a lot of engagement over the last few weeks. I could also show you a number of posts from early in the year where it has somewhat died and the discussion ended and the forum post was later on not necessarily picked up by core dev team member or anyone else in the community to proceed in the governance process. So part of what we've done when we put together the prioritization list for delegation experience enhancements was in response to the fact that we've had a number of posts in, you know, build up, you know, in the forum that we wanted to provide visibility around to also make sure under the community understands they have not been forgotten about. But we also have, I think, an area of improvement to just improve our consistency. Um, reality is that we have not always been following the process that I described earlier in the most stringent way. Um, meaning that, for example, community voting you know, didn't always consistently happen for every single GIP that's been out there. So we want to be more consistent and, and follow a more established process and also become more transparent with everything that's out there in an effort to really improve our overall engagement from the community around proposals, you know, to make sure that everybody understands where things are in the pipeline. And a group of us is right now working on putting a little bit more definition around that and think about processes that help strengthen that. But two key takeaways just from this segment, and I will conclude here shortly, is this is the place where you can engage. I described how you can engage. Feel free, nobody is restricted or limited. Everybody can, can jump in and share their thoughts on active discussions that we have. In fact, as a decentralized network, this is how we're going to do it. And this is what 
we want to do more of in the future. We want the more engagement we get, the more confident we are that this is really something that the community supports. So everybody is invited and it is a great way to connect with people, to get to know them better and to also introduce yourself. That is, I think, another you know, key point here. So with that, let me stop here and open it up for questions. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question um, about the migration of subgraphs. Uh, right now, I think in the, in the graph study, we mostly see Ethereum-based subgraphs, if, if I'm correct. And, and is there any um, effort or like push to have more different blockchain subgraphs move towards the, the graph studio part? Yeah, I think I saw Ford in here with us. Ford, can you maybe speak to that? Maybe we can bring up Ford. Yeah. Not responding. So uh, let me give you my answer. And I'm uh, not engaged in the core development piece. I'm from the foundation, but eventually, yes, we are. You know, the goal is to have everything on the decentralized mainnet. Um, as to the timing of things, I, I can't tell you what what to expect. What the expected timelines uh, there are. It is correct that right now mainnet supports EVM chains, um, and you know, our path to get everyone up there is something, you know, from a timeline perspective, I can't speak to that. Yeah, I'll Thank try you. to add something as well, Oliver. Um, yeah, we, we, we don't have a proper timeline in place yet, but we are working on a roadmap and we know for sure that we will start with the EVM chains. Uh, we'll start slowly mi uh, migrating those over to the decentralized network. And this will be done, yes, within the Accord Dev um, working group. So hopefully in a couple of weeks, we will have a blog post highlighting all of this road, roadmap and this should be uh, a bit clearer. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, last time we went 10 minutes over. This time I give you 10 minutes back, so we're net zero. And thank you everyone for joining. I hope you have enjoyed today's community talk and we'll see you again next month. Thank you. <laughs>